Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now over the past few weeks I've had a lot of fun messing around with the Ryzen 3 3100, a 4 core 8 threaded chip that seems to be the CPU that I've taken to using on a daily basis. Now I've overclocked it using the stock cooler, everything seems to be going fine and today I couldn't help but wondering just how it would perform with different clock speeds. So what I did and this is something that you should probably never do or have any need to do, was clock the CPU to three gigahertz and then try to take it as low as it would go as well to two gigahertz. Now I ended up actually having to set it to 2.2 gigahertz. This was the lowest that I could actually get it in the BIOS. So we'll be testing the chip at 2.2 gigahertz, three gigahertz and at four gigahertz. Why? Well, I just thought it would be interesting to see what the difference would be between these three clock speeds. Is gaming performance badly affected? And if so, by how much? I'd like to reiterate that you probably shouldn't do this. There's no real need to do this, but the subject has come up a lot of times um, in questions that you guys have sent me. So I thought, why don't we give it a go and see what happens? So without further ado, let's get in to the gameplay results. I should also mention that as usual, I am using 16 gigs of 3200 MHz DDR4 as well as my trusty RTX 2070. So let's start with Call of Duty Warzone. I've put the different clock speed results side by side, going from lowest to highest, left to right. On the very left, we have the game running on the 3100 clocked at 2.2 gigahertz. In the middle, we have three gigahertz, and on the right, we have the chip overclocked to four gigahertz. Now at four gigahertz, you probably won't see that much of a difference over the stock speed, but the Ryzen 3100 can be overclocked to four gigahertz easily on the stock cooler, and perhaps a little bit beyond. I've actually managed 4.2. In Warzone, I was quite surprised to see that the the average figures were very close and at 2.2 gigahertz we saw a better result than at 3. The same can't be said for the 1 and 0.1% low figures though but they are still very respectable and at no point throughout today's tests did we see any game breaking stutter or lag. As you know CSGO is a more CPU dependent title so this is where I thought we'd see a pretty big difference and I was right. Again, that isn't to say that any of the results were bad, even with the 2.2 GHz speed setting offering decent frame rates, unless you want to play at 144 FPS, in which case it falls ever so slightly short. The 3 and 4 GHz results both demonstrated over 200 frames per second on average though, and as you can see the 0.1% low was quite poor throughout. I didn't notice any drops that would cause this, but it was consistent with all the results, so even at 4 GHz this occurred. I think this was probably the biggest frame rate difference that you're going to see today, but our next tested title also exhibited some large differences, and let's move on to that one now. This is of course the classic that is Grand Theft Auto V. Just like with Counter-Strike, we saw playable frame rates at all clock speeds, though anyone looking for that solid 60fps experience may not get it at 2.2GHz as we did see a couple of drops below that. To be honest though, you're probably not going to be running your Ryzen CPU at 2.2GHz, but that information is out there on the table. These results were taken from the in-game benchmark run, though even in-game there was no stutter to report yet again. The frame rate was however noticeably different, especially between the 2.2 and 3 gigahertz results, mainly because at 3 gigahertz things remained more consistently solid. Now just like with all the results, the graphics card plays a big part as well. So had I done these tests with a 2080 Ti, if I owned one, the gap between the numbers might be even larger. I actually think the RTX 2070 is probably a good pairing for this chip, and it will even be a bottleneck in some scenarios. A more budget focused builder might want something like a 2060 or 2060 Super instead. Perhaps the most interesting result was that of Rage 2, which seemed to do better at 3 GHz than at 4. Performance between these speeds was very similar, even down to the 1 and 0.1% lows. More impressive than that though is how the 2.2 GHz results also produced a better average compared to the chip clocked at 4. 
We were using the same Ryzen chip each time, just to make that clear, and I was adjusting the speed in the BIOS after each set of tests. With all that said, the percentile figures at 2.2GHz were quite a bit worse. In Red Dead Redemption 2, I took a stroll through Valentine, a pretty demanding area of this vast open world, and recorded the results here, as I thought this would demonstrate more of a difference between the CPU speeds. In fact, this was probably one of the closest results I saw today. The 3 and 4 GHz figures were nearly identical across the percentile figures and the average, though even at 2.2, there wasn't too much difference. The average was certainly lower, but as far as the other figures were concerned, it was a pretty solid effort. I have noticed that Red Dead Redemption 2 does tend to rely more on graphical power, which is great for lower end CPU users, but I had certainly anticipated more of a problem when running this epic open world title, especially in and around busy towns like Valentine. Now I then ran the Cinebench R20 multi-threaded test at 2.2 giga, I, I really cannot say gigahertz, I really struggled to say gigahertz, I, I don't know if you've noticed it, but it, I find it very difficult, I have some sort of speech impediment that stops me saying letters, certain letters, but I'll try, I try my hardest, at 2.2 gigahertz, <laughs> <laughs> the Cinebench R20 scored 1298, which was 250 points ahead of an older i5-3550. I've told you about some other CPU results as well, just to put these results into perspective. At 3 GHz, the uh, CPU scored 1770, or 1770 points, which was 230 points behind a Ryzen 5 3400G. And at 4 gigahertz, the uh, chip scored 2,338, which was just 80 points shy of a 7700K, though a slightly beefier overclock may actually put this chip ahead of Intel's old school high-end offering, which is very impressive. We've mentioned it before, but that really is something to be respected, especially when this is a £99 or $99 part. It was at this point I actually decided to go back into the BIOS and set things to 4.2 gigahertz um, with 1.325 volts just to see whether or not we could overtake the i7 7700K score in Cinebench R20 and we were able to exceed it by about 60 points when applying that overclock again. This was with the stock cooler. It's nice to see that you don't have to replace it in order to overclock it though for a long-term solution you might want to think about be for your cooling. Speaking of which, it was at this point I actually wanted to check the temperatures because I've just said that the stock cooler is fine, but at 4.2 gigahertz, things actually get a little bit too hot. You're looking at well over 80 degrees. Uh, temperatures for the chip at 2.2 gigahertz. Now these tests weren't anything over complicated. I just recorded the low temps during a Cinebench R20 test at 2.2 gigahertz. The CPU reached a maximum of 56 degrees. When we switched things back to 3 gigahertz, we saw 62 degrees, and at 4 gigahertz, the chip hit 80 degrees. So there we have it. The Ryzen 3 3100 seems to be a capable chip at 2.2 GHz, 3 GHz and 4 GHz, though your best bet is leaving it at stock speeds on the stock cooler. If you've crammed this CPU into a small case with limited airflow and low profile cooling, then maybe underclocking or downclocking, whatever you want to call it, would be ideal for keeping those temperatures lower, but again, it shouldn't be necessary. I hope you've enjoyed what has been a result of my curiosity. We've done something similar with the Ryzen 5 3600 in the past and actually got that down to 800 megahertz or 0.8 gigahertz. Some games still ran fine even then, to be honest, but as you'd probably expect, there was quite a bit of stutter in certain titles. In the next one, we might be looking back at something a little older, uh, but nonetheless, I hope you can join me for that video. I'd also like to say thank you to all of you for subscribing because we recently hit 350,000 subscribers here on this channel, which was pretty unexpected to be honest. Not bad for someone who's been winging it for the last five years. Seriously though, thank you for watching this video and all the others. If you enjoyed this one, be sure to leave a like on it down below. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Leave a comment below as well, letting me know what you think. 
whether or not you run with an underclocked chip for whatever reason. And uh, hopefully I'll see you all in the next one.